up here to call us to suffer. And that's a difficult thing to say. It's a difficult thing for me to say to you this morning because I love you. And of course there are many ways in which I don't ever want to see you suffer. I hate it when I see any of you suffering. Whether it be through pain, uh, through illness, or through the grief of, of losing a loved one, through unemployment, through a relationship breakdown, I hate to see you suffer. And yet this morning, it's my job to stand here and to proclaim from the scriptures uh, that you are called to a life of suffering. It's my job to encourage you to suffer this morning. Suffering isn't a popular idea, is it? No. Nope. The call to suffer could, could not be further from the modern materialistic battle cry of do what makes you happy. Do what's easiest. Do what makes you comfortable. We are surrounded by a culture which says, sit yourselves down and, and make yourselves comfortable as long as you're not you know, causing too many ripples and bothering too many people. We have a, a media and advertising that says, you're worth it. We have a society that says, you shouldn't have to hear an opinion that you might find offensive. Nothing, including other people's ideas or opinions, should ever make you uncomfortable. That's the world that we live in. And amongst all of this noise, almost being drowned out, we don't take care to listen carefully. We hear the voice of the Apostle Paul saying, share in suffering. Share in suffering. And let there be no mistake this morning, Paul here isn't talking about what we should do if we suffer. He's not even just affirming that we will suffer. But he is actively um, affirming, um, rather it is an, uh, an active instruction to suffer. He's telling us to suffer. Paul's language here is, is in the imperative. It's a command. It's an instruction. Paul is actively calling Timothy and the church, that's you and me, to a life of suffering. But to reiterate what, what I said about my desire to see you guys suffer, in the same way, it's not that Paul just wants Timothy to have a really rough time of it. It's not that Timothy's done something to upset Paul and he really wants him to have a, a miserable life. We see that the way that Paul writes to Timothy, he loves him. He has compassion for him. It's not that Paul is wanting to relish in Timothy's suffering or grief. It's that Paul is calling Timothy to a specific type and a specific kind of suffering. Suffering for the gospel. Suffering for the gospel. As I've been reading this and all week been thinking about what I'm going to say to you this morning. I mean, obviously, um, I'm dictated to by Scripture what I must say, but the question in my heart has been, how does this apply to my people? How does this apply to the people in front of me? I've been praying, Lord, how do I explain this? What does this mean for the people who are going to be at Worthing Tabernacle on Sunday morning? The people you've given me to preach to. What does this mean? See, if we were preaching in, in, in North Korea, it would be very easy for me to know how to apply this. If I were preaching in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria, places where Christians are being killed for the gospel, it would be very easy to know what to say to them. But it would be wrong this morning it would be disingenuous for me to stand here and to pretend that we suffer in those same ways here in the UK as they do in North Korea and Afghanistan and Syria. In fact, I think it would be disingenuous to say that we suffer for the gospel at all in the UK. 
We suffer, we do, don't we? We all suffer with griefs and with pains. But most of our suffering is not due to gospel proclamation. Most of it is just because we live in a sinful, fallen world where death has entered. We don't suffer in the ways perhaps that Paul is addressing here and the ways that our brothers and sisters do across the world. Here the word that Paul uses for suffering carries the idea of distress, affliction, harm, loss, torment, torture. Suffer, uh, su- it means suffering with a hemorrhage, suffering with bleeding. Bleeding in our suffering. Not many of us suffer in these ways for the gospel. Now, um, we may be made to feel socially uncomfortable for the gospel. That's not very nice. But seldom do we suffer in these ways that Paul has outlined. And so thinking about how I'm going to apply this to us this morning, um, thinking about how we must approach this teaching, I think the first thing that must be said is we don't suffer enough. We don't suffer enough. Just hear that for a moment and and just let that sink in. We don't suffer enough for the gospel. And I think we need to ask two questions in reply to that. Why? Why don't we suffer for the gospel? Think about that. And secondly, what is our attitude towards suffering for the gospel? Is it something we welcome? Or do we put all of our energies and prayers into protecting ourselves and our church from suffering in gospel proclamation? Those are two questions I think we need to think about as we approach this text and as we seek answers from God's word. So I think as we approach this passage then, it addresses four things for us. It tells us four things. It tells us what we should do. It tells us how we should do it. It tells us why we should do it. And then it finishes with an encouragement and a warning. Let me just encourage us this morning as we, as we embark on looking at this passage, um, as we look at this idea of suffering for the gospel, to some of us, even what I've just said may seem hard. It may seem uncomfortable. It might not seem nice. It may grate against your view It may even have left you confused. Surely uh, the Lord doesn't want us to suffer. If this doesn't make sense to you, if you struggle with it, then consider Paul's words in verse 7. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Paul is speaking particularly about the illustrations he's using here, but it is true more generally as well. Think over God's word and he will grant us understanding. So let's engage our minds as well as our hearts as we look at these words. So the first thing it tells us is what we should do. What we should do. And that's already been answered really, hasn't it? We're we're to suffer. We are to suffer. We're to share in suffering. That's what we're to do as, as gospel people. Suffering for the gospel. But before we move on from that, in many ways, simple and yet profound statement, consider then the background, that background on on Paul's words in verse 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So often we go to this verse and we pluck it out in isolation. It's a very helpful verse uh, when we want to talk about training future leaders. Indeed, I did it myself, and I was talking about 83 at our AGM recently. And it's true. That that is true. It's a legitimate use of that that verse. Paul is concerned, isn't he? He's concerned that the teaching be passed on, that the gospel be passed on. And not just to other people, though it must be, but specifically to other people who themselves are able, equipped, and gifted to pass it on to others. That's why, that's why I'm here as the assistant pastor. I, I'm, I'm here learning, uh, training how to pass on the gospel. That's why Garrett is coming uh, from the States. He's going to come and learn how to pass on the gospel. That's why Steve will be working and training with us, learning to pass on the gospel. 
What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's what Paul wants. And that, by the way, is the true apostolic succession. I said last week, didn't I, that we, we, we don't have apostles anymore, not in the same way as Paul was. There are none now who write and speak with the authority in the way that the apostles did. I mean, the apostles, they, they wrote the New Testament. Their words were God's words. They were, had the same authority as Scripture. That doesn't happen anymore. No one can speak with the same authority as Scripture, but the apostles did. But, that being said, we do believe in apostolic succession. And we see it here in verse 7. Last week we were thinking about our call as gospel people to, to guard the good deposit, to guard the teaching, to guard the word. That is the duty of the church and that God is the guarantor of that. Well, the fact that we're here today, the fact that we're here this morning preaching from this word is evidence that that promise of God has, has been kept. The word has been handed down from generation to generation and we stand in that stream of faithful preaching and teaching, declaring the word all the way from Paul through Timothy, through many faithful men to, to, to today, through many men and women who were able to teach others. This is truly the apostolic succession. Not the passing on of spiritual gifts, not the passing on of new revelation, but the passing on of the word. That is the most important thing to pass on. It is the word, it is the gospel, it is the only thing that can change lives and bring glory to God. And so Paul urges Timothy to pass on the gospel. And when we put it in the context of the apostasy of Asia, of the churches turning away... When we put it in the context of Paul being in prison, and we put it in the context of, of this that he's talking about suffering, we see something of the urgency with which Paul is speaking. Pass it on, Timothy. Because the likelihood is, it won't be long before you're in my position. That's what Paul sees here. Timothy, you're going to suffer. It might not be long before you're in my position, so pass it on. Pass on the gospel. Get busy preaching the gospel. You might not be round for long. That's Paul's heart. That's his urgency. And I wonder if we would have a fresh urgency in our evangelism if we were unsure whether we were going to be able to do it tomorrow. If there was a genuine concern that today might be the last day, if we were wondering that this might be the Sunday when they eventually break in through the doors and raid us, lock me and Rich up, and shut us down, would that change our hearts towards getting the word out whilst there's still time? This was something of Timothy's reality. The, the hardships that they were living in. It was the reality of the church. And so Paul calls Timothy to pass it on. Not just to pass it on, but also specifically pass it on to people, to men who can pass it on themselves. So, we are called to suffer. We're called to pass on the teaching. The next question then is how? How are we to suffer then? Paul, Paul calls us to suffer. How are we to do that? What is our suffering to be like? Are we to take part in uh, self-flagellation? You know, just whipping ourselves? Does is, is that count? Well, I've suffered today. I'm not worthy. Are we just to invite people to abuse us? Well, no. Of course not. That's a complete misunderstanding of Christian suffering. The suffering we are called to is very specifically for the sake of the gospel. And Paul uses three illustrations to describe the suffering that we are called to. Let's look at verse 3 to 7. Sharing the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. The first picture that Paul uses is a good soldier of Christ. Now we're, um, 
familiar with Paul using military illustrations. He's used them before, hasn't he? Um, Paul spent a long time around soldiers being arrested, being put on trial, being beaten up by them. He is familiar with soldiers. And he's used the image of a soldier, hasn't he? Or of a soldier's armour before when talking about spiritual warfare. But here, the image that... uh, Uh, that he's using here is not one of fighting but rather a willingness of the soldier to suffer the willingness to suffer and concentrate suffer and concentrate soldiers on active duty do not expect an easy time soldiers on active duty do not expect a safe or easy time they they take hardship risk and suffering as a matter of course it's what they expect in fact more so is what they have signed up for now it's not that soldiers have um, some mental deficiency or they're unbalanced or they're masochistic when they sign up for hardship it's not that they just want the hardship it's not that that's what they desire but rather it's because they are saying that there is something they consider more precious more important than their own safety and comfort there is a higher calling on their life usually king and country they fight for their nation they fight for their family that's what they're there for that's why they're willing to suffer And this, Paul says, is to be true of us also. Uh, We're not, this morning, I hope you don't all walk out in the street and ask people to randomly punch you. That's not what we want. It's not that we just want to suffer because we're unbalanced. But we seek to suffer for the furtherance of our cause, the gospel. We stand for something which is greater than our own comfort, safety or well-being. We stand... For the testimony of Christ, the gospel, that life-giving, saving, reconciling gospel, as Paul has already outlined in the first chapter of this letter. We're to suffer as a good soldier. To be wounded in the line of battle, to give your life for queen and country, is an honourable way for a soldier to go. You find any soldier... A one who's a true soldier at heart, he would say there's honour in dying for his country. Do we find the same honour in suffering for Christ? Would we find that an honour? There have been martyrs throughout the ages who have. Some in this country. Many still today across the world. Do we seek it out? Are we enlisting As a good soldier of Christ. But Paul speaks not only of a soldier's willingness to suffer. But also of his focus in that suffering. He says no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Now see a soldier is happy to to suffer for the cause that he signs up for. That is, he's willing to suffer for the one who's enlisted him, his leader, his king, his captain. But he is not to be involved in civilian pursuits. He is set aside. He is focused. His energies, his suffering, everything is concentrated on his objective, regardless of what is going on around him. I'm sure we've all seen, either in person or in pictures, uh, the royal guards outside of the palace. You know them in their, their, their black, big black hats, their red jackets. They stand there, don't they? Perfectly still. And tourists can come up to them and take their selfies with them, give them a, try and knock them over and all sorts of things, try and bother them. But they don't move. They don't move. They are focused on their task. And they're not just there for show. They are generally there, loaded weapons, ready to guard. They are surveying the area. They are a coiled spring, ready to fight and die for the queen nothing distracts them from that duty whatever's going on around them and that has to be us as christians of course we cannot avoid the ordinary duties of home and of work and of community and neither should we when he says we should not be entangled in civilian pursuits it's not that we should withdraw from the world because it's in those places that we preach the gospel 
but we must not get distracted by them. We shouldn't get distracted by them. We shouldn't get sidetracked by silly disagreements. I think that's particularly helpful this week, isn't it? Whatever's going on out there, whatever's going on in politics, whatever way anybody in this room voted this morning, we're not to be distracted by that. We come here as one. We come here with a gospel focus. And let's not get distracted, especially this morning, by talking about other things. We're here as good soldiers of Christ to be focused on the gospel. We should have the focus of a soldier. And this focus is sharpened through suffering. During times of war, some of you will know this better than I, people gain a certain perspective, don't they? A certain perspective on the world. And they realise what's really important. During the Second World War, when food was rationed, uh, people had to be prepared for bombings. They had to, to work harder. They had to give up certain luxuries. But in all of that, the nation, because of that, banded together. They heartily suffered these things together because as they would say to one another, there's a war on, you know. That was the call. That's what they said to to justify anything they had to give up because there's a war on. Now we are to have that wartime mentality, a gospel perspective that doesn't sweat the little inconsequential things, the non-gospel things. Let me say, um, this isn't the case mostly for the church in the West, is it? We're not under attack. We're not really suffering. And so we easily get, get distracted by the silly things. Let me suggest that the church in, North, in the church in North Korea, there are no worship wars. There is no discussion in the church of, well, I prefer this instrument over that. I prefer these songs over these songs. This style over that style. In Iraq, there will be no fallout or discussion over where the, whether the pastor is wearing a tie around his neck. They're more concerned about the noose. In Syria, they're not expressing their disappointment that the preacher is using illustrations from certain films or books. Because those things are unimportant. And the problem is there's nothing really to trouble us here in the West. And so we end up focusing on these trivial, silly things. The believers in the persecuted church are good soldiers fighting the gospel battle of suffering they don't have time for side issues they're focused on what's central they don't have time for civilian pursuits they don't have time for pursuits which are about anything other than the gospel and that's why i say carefully and yes we have to be careful what we wish for but i think we could do with some more suffering in our churches in the uk if for no other reason than to draw us together. To, to remind us of what is central. Paul also uses the picture of an athlete. That's another favourite one of his, isn't it? An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules, Paul says. We'll deal with this one much more briefly. Essentially, Paul is telling Timothy here that there is no shortcut to success. There is no shortcut to glory. There is no shortcut to life eternal. If you want to win the crown of righteousness, and that's how he talks about it later in Timothy, you have to finish the race. You have to make all the checkpoints. You cannot cut any of the corners. You have to work hard. You have to suffer in running the race. There is no easy shortcut to the end of the Christian life. And finally, Paul speaks of our suffering as like uh, the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. I have not been shy in sharing my my, how how adverse I am to working the land. I'm no gardener. But I'm, I'm familiar enough to know that farming is hard work. There is much toil involved, even today with our modern machines and tools, but even more so when Paul was writing. And I may suggest that unlike the pictures of the soldier, unlike the athlete, the farmer's work is a thankless task. 
It's devoid of excitement. It's devoid of, of praise. But this also is what our toiling for the gospel must be like. It will largely go unnoticed by man, but not by God. He sees. It will largely go unnoticed. And if you do suffer in the face of the work, many will not know. And in saying that, I'm going to say maybe there are some here this morning, either here or listening or watching this later, who have suffered for the gospel. Who have truly suffered that, that I don't know about, that we don't know about. Maybe some of you have bled for the gospel. Maybe some of you have been beaten or injured. Maybe physically or perhaps also emotionally. If that is you this morning, let me say, keep working. Keep toiling. Keep, keep running. Keep fighting. Because it is good for you. Because it's good for you. And here in this illustration, Paul moves on really from how we should do it to why we should do it. What we should do, how we should do, why we should do it. Because in verse 6, it is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Paul says, keep toiling and suffering because there is a crop in it for you. There is something there for you. There are fruits for the farmer. There are fruits for you in your suffering for the gospel. Uh, what is that crop that we share in? What is that fruit? Well, I think there's several things that, this, that Paul's illustration points to. Firstly, I think there's the obvious picture, uh, the obvious illustration of the harvest of souls. Suffering for the, in suffering for the gospel, you will share in the harvest. You'll be part of bringing in the harvest. You shall find joy in that and you'll be blessed in that even when it's hard and i think something of what what jeffrey and what brenda have shared this morning of going down there yes it can be uncomfortable at first it can be hard but there's joy in the work there's joy in it for you and you'll have the great reward of seeing souls in heaven and people in the new heavens and the new earth that that god used you to bring there there's that fruit. But secondly, there is a harvest of spiritual fruits. Uh, the work of the Spirit in your life to bring about holiness. That happens in suffering. Holiness is brought about. The writer to the Hebrews uh, says in chapter 12, he says, My son, in verses 5 to 6, if you want to look it up later, My son, do not regard lightly the, the discipline of the Lord, or be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves god is working by the suffering in our lives to love us that's how he loves us to discipline us to train us and we are made more like jesus through our sufferings we are made more holy that calling that we are called to we are we are called to a holy calling as we thought in one timothy in in chapter one of two timothy but thirdly why should we suffer for the gospel? Paul outlines explicitly why we should here in verses 8 and 12. Look at verse 8. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. The first thing Paul says is, remember Jesus. This is why we are to embrace suffering. Because Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, our example, he suffered. He suffered and he died in your place. He died for you. He died to offer you life. And he is now risen from the dead. Remember Christ, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Paul says, the worst thing the world can do to you is kill you. But you follow the one who has been through death. You follow the one who has risen. You follow the one who has promised you life if you follow him. So what have you to fear? <coughs> death is painful. Death is an intrusion in God's creation. It's never what it was meant to be. But ultimately, it is toothless if we are in Christ. 
It hurts now. But ultimately, in Christ, there is victory in it. And then Paul clears up any potential misunderstandings in verses 11 to 12. He says, The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. This is so precious this morning. We have died with him on the cross. We have died with Jesus. On the cross, he took our place. He represented us. When he was there, he was there for us and we were with him. He has died and risen for us so that we can die for him without fear. We can die for the gospel because we know we are held in eternal hands. Paul reminds us here that actually all of this isn't about our suffering. That's not the main thing. It's about Jesus' suffering. We are not called to suffer because it purges us of sin. We are not called to suffer because we need to in order to be saved, to rid our body of sin or anything like that. We're not called to suffer in order to be saved. Jesus has done all of that already. He has suffered to save us. He has suffered to redeem us. His suffering saves us. Our suffering doesn't. If anything though, uh, as Paul writes, and we'll think about it maybe a bit later, I think in verse 10, um, our suffering is to save others actually. Not in a salvic way that that Christ was for us, but Paul says... um, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Paul's suffering was for the sake of the elect, was for those who were to be saved. Our suffering doesn't save us, but it might be used in saving others. But Jesus has one, is the one who suffered for us. He is the one who saves us. And we are called to suffer so that we may share in Christ's sufferings. And so sharing in his sufferings, we share in his blessings and in his life. That's Paul's concern. There is no sharing in his life if we don't share in his sufferings. Paul doesn't want Timothy to to miss out on the blessing of the gospel. Life eternal with Jesus. He doesn't want him to miss out on that because he shied away from the cost of discipleship, which is suffering. That's why he's concerned to call us to suffering. Don't shy away from it because in in sharing in Christ's suffering, you'll share in his life. And Paul finishes by warning us against rejecting Jesus. In verse 12 he says, If we deny him, he will also deny us. Terrifying words. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. If we deny Jesus, there's places in Scripture we read it, don't we, where he says, no, I did not know you. Come that day, do we want to stand before Almighty God and have Jesus say, I did not know you? If we deny Jesus, he will deny us. But if we proclaim Jesus, we are his in the gospel, he will acknowledge us. He will say, these are my children, the ones I have died for. And also don't misunderstand what Paul is saying here. When he says, um, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Oh, that's all right then. Get out of jail, jail free card. No, that's not, uh, that's not what this is saying. When, we, when suffering comes and we crumple, we show that the gospel is not the reality that's holding up our lives. If suffering comes and we deny the gospel, we are denying Jesus. We'd rather deny Jesus than suffer for the gospel. If that's true, then we don't have it. And we don't have it. We don't understand it. Paul is not saying that even when we are faithless to Jesus, he will remain faithful to us. That's not what he's saying. But God is saying that even when we are faithless, God is faithful to his own nature. He is faithful to his own promises, for he cannot deny himself. We may have the covenant, we may be faithless to that covenant, but God is not. He is faithful. This is not a comforting assurance that even if we turn from Christ, he will not turn from us. But rather that he will be faithful to his warnings. He will be faithful to the gospel. That if you are not in Christ, 
There is no salvation. We may be faithless and fickle, but Christ is not. He is the faithful one. He's faithful to his promises. Hallelujah. And he's faithful to his warnings as well. So as we close then, what do we take away from Paul's words? May I suggest a few things. Firstly, that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. In a world where suffering exists, Jesus is still Lord. And he's coming again to take us home. To prepare, to, to bring us to a place where there's no crying, no suffering, no pain, no mourning anymore. And everything will be made new. Jesus is the suffering servant. He is the one who has suffered more than any man has in bearing the sin of the world and having the, the, the Father turn his face away from him on the cross. And he's done it all for you. He's done it for you this morning. To make a way back to God. To make a way back that you couldn't make yourself. Jesus is Lord. Secondly, I don't think the church in the UK suffers enough for the gospel. And I think if we suffered more, we would grow. North Korea, Afghanistan and Iran, three places in the world where Christians are most persecuted, if the information I had was up to date. There, uh, they are the, and they are the three places, those three places where Christians and the church is most hotly persecuted are the three places where the church is growing fastest. And in fact, in many places, if you look at a map, uh, I had a nice colour-coordinated one because I need colours and not numbers. A nice colour-coordinated one which tells us where the most suffering is and lay it over with one which tells us where the church is growing fastest. You'll find more often where the church is being persecuted, it is growing. The UK, by the way, zero persecution. By the criteria in which these things are measured, zero persecution. And what are we experiencing? Negative growth. We're in decline. Across the UK, we're in decline. And I'm not just guessing, there are stats on this. Verse 10. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You see, Paul directly links his suffering with the salvation of the elect. Now, we don't have time to get into all of that, but I think it's worth noting, as I mentioned before, Paul's suffering for the gospel in some way is used to obtain salvation for others. When people see you suffering for the gospel, that is a witness to Christ. That is a witness that he is enough. The gospel is sufficient. How can Paul write the things he writes whilst on death row in prison? Because that's how great the gospel is. And so I would leave us with a question and a challenge. A question and a challenge. First, a question to reflect on. Why aren't we facing persecution? I don't have an answer for that this morning. Why aren't we facing persecution? Something we should think about. But secondly, a challenge. And this is very practical. This is where it gets to us. How do we pray about suffering? How do we pray about it? What do our prayers say about our attitude to suffering? Do we pray for ease and comfort? Is that number one on our prayer list? Do we pray that the government uh, would not pass laws which would make it any more difficult for us? Are our prayers, Lord, don't shut down the churches? Are our prayers, Lord, don't let the government make it difficult for us? Do we pray that the church would not be persecuted? In a note from a pastor in the persecuted church, um, he, he wrote this. He says, please don't pray that our suffering would stop. Pray that we would remain faithful. That's a hard prayer. That's a hard prayer. That's a gospel prayer. That's a challenge to us, isn't it? It's a challenge to us. Things getting harder for the church, things getting harder for, for, for you and for me, might be the best thing to happen for the, for the gospel in this country, for the church, for the salvation of lost people. 
It would cause us to rally around the truth. It would help us to really make the main thing the main thing. I tell you now, it would get rid of all the wolves in the church. And it would strengthen us in Jesus. Can we pray? Actually, Lord, maybe it's time to make things a bit more difficult for us. I'm just putting that out there. I don't know. That's a hard prayer. But where are our hearts? Are we looking at what's best for us? Or are we praying about what's best for the gospel? Paul was able to say in verse 9, I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. We may be bound. Pastors may be locked up for preaching the gospel. There may come a day when you're doing Saturday conversations and you're put in the cell for an evening. But do you know what? That's okay. Because the gospel won't be bound. How, how well things are going for us is not a reflection on how well things are going for the gospel. The gospel will not be bound. Praise Jesus. Let's pray.